Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Sam of United People's TV. I can see the chat coming through. Is that coming? Yeah, I think it's coming in on Facebook as well. Round of applause for me. Round of applause for me. I think we've got it working. Sure, Murphy, I can see your comments there. It was a little bit annoying these last few days, but look, good morning to you. Are Manchester United adopting a shift in transfer strategy? That is going to be the headline for today's show. We're also going to speak about Mainu. He's going to be making his full international debut tonight against Belgium. Garnacho, he's going to be making his full Argentina debut in a friendly, I think, against Costa Rica. <sighs> Excess tabs open. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, but we've got it there. Just a few other things I had to fix before the show uh, with the team, but we got there in the end. Um, good morning to everybody. Can I just say one more time? I know Nuruddin's not here because he's having a few days off, but Nuruddin gifting 150 memberships. It's no joke, man. It just goes to show how amazing this place is. It really, really is to invite other people in. I know I'd speak about it so much, but it deserves to be spoken about, and it's what separates us from everything else that is out there. Big up to you. Alex, you're liking the yellow background. This is the transfer background. And I'm also working on the new whiteboard for this summer. It was a big feature last summer. Going to make it a big feature this summer. Who's here from the member gangs? Have a look. DP, we've got Kenny. We've got Daryl, Joe. Good morning to you, Vicky. Uh, Gungshi, Carl, Alex. Plenty of mods as well. Um, we've got T. I saw you there at the start too. JC, Andrew Wright, Stu, Top Dog. Um, Natasha, Brian, Sandman, who's from Facebook? Because I can see your comments on Facebook today. All right. Got it working. Um, Kanja, good morning to you. Uh, we've got Siraj. We've got um, Osan Jr. We've got um, Dwayne. We've got Bevan and Harry Doran. Morning from a wet Dublin. Well, good morning to you. <sighs> I'm looking forward to this show. And this conversation we're going to have towards the end of the show about maybe a shift in trend... We've already spoken about the shift in transfer policy, right? Which is Jim Ratcliffe saying, we don't want to sign Mbappe. We want to sign the next Mbappe, which is absolutely what Man United should be doing. It's the right strategy to do. But there's a little bit more to it now. I'm going to speak about that um, Boca Junior centre-back we'll be getting linked with, an 18-year-old, and also a 16-year-old striker from Milan. And also speak about... It's going to be an interesting chat. I think you'll like it. All right, let's get into the show. And there's there's one point I want to start with here, right? And it's not... I don't understand how you can be racist. In, in, I don't know. The, in, in the modern day. It must be to do with education. It must be to do with the older generation. And the kids that are still affected by it. But you're an absolute prick. Like a prick of the highest order. If you're racist, there's just... I, I, I can't... I just don't understand it. In, in, in the modern age. It must be down to education. And it, it just... You know how... Um, was it? Every player in the Premier League kind of taking the knee and it ended up becoming like a... It just felt like a symbolic gesture for the Premier League. Oh, yeah, we're doing something about it. Well, you're doing absolutely sweet FA. That's, that was Vinicius Jr. there, who has been subjected to racist abuse out in Madrid for as long as he's been there. And it, it, he got overwhelmed by it when speaking about it. Um... In the, in the Brazilian press conference yesterday. Uh, Rafa Varane went and sort of gave his support to him. And it's just... I don't get it. I don't know how you stop it. And I, I, I don't get it. And it must be to do with education. It must be to do with... Um, yeah. It has to be. It has to be passed down. You are not born racist. <laughs> you learn to be racist. That's my opinion on it anyway. It's just... It's just shit that it still exists, man. It's just shit that these conversations still go on. <sighs> Dear me. I don't know what else I'm going to say about it. Uh, just wanted to sort of mention that. Um, yeah, right. Well, let's get into the show. And let's speak about 
a player who, um, let's be honest, we've only mentioned him a couple of times over the international break. Kobe Mainu. I th I'm pretty sure, can somebody let me know, right? So there's a couple of people asked about this question yesterday. So what does the number 1280 mean? I'm kind of guessing that means that he's the 1,280th player to play for England. Is that right? Can somebody let me know in the comments? Because that kind of makes sense. Because there's, there's nothing on that cap about it. Who they played? Played Brazil in a friendly, didn't they? There's nothing on there about the, the fact that England played Brazil. So I'm guessing it's, what is it, the 1,280th game that England played? Or 1,280th player to play? Quite a few of you down there are saying that's in, the, that's in his comments. <laughs> JC, like that. I know, no, that's, that's his football like you. <laughs> like that. But Kobe Mainu, right? Came off the bench against Brazil and just looked like Kobe Mainu. Didn't he? Right? Just looked like Kobe Mainu. Comfortable, composed, exactly how he looked with the under 18s, with the FA Youth Cup win, with the United's first team, and now with England. And tonight, Matthew, did it. And why, have they, why have they not brought back stars in their eyes? That was elite Saturday night TV in the UK. Big break. Jim Davidson's generation game. Noel's house. Gladiators. National Lottery used to be great to watch as well. I swear they used to make a whole show out of it. And stars in her eyes. Anyway, segue. But Kobe Mainu is set to start tonight for England against Belgium. And I'm looking forward to I'm I'm going to watch that game tonight because of Kobe Mainu. I wonder who I'm guessing. I'm guessing he's going to start with Declan Rice. I mean, it kind of it feels like it feels like the right partnership, Declan Rice and Kobe. But we'll see. I'm I'm guessing on an international level for sure. Kobe Mainu, the profile of Kobe Mainu would be somebody who's the first phase build-up midfielder, the player who receives the ball from the defence and under pressure situations is able to either work his way through it or pass around it. That, I imagine, is what you're going to see from Kobe Mania. I don't particularly think that's the profile I want to see him in the long term at Manchester United. I want to see another number six sort of signed and Kobe Mania to be the hybrid with a little bit more freedom to go forward because somebody defensively is covering ground behind him. But anyway, he's going to be making his first start for England tonight. And I, if I remember correctly... I think Kobe Mainu is the third youngest Manchester United player to make their debut for England. Quiz, who are the two United players who made their England debuts younger than Kobe Mainu? You're not going to win anything. It's just a question, and I know the answer. Let me see who gets the answer down here first. You're talking about the new Gladiators. Doesn't that have what's-his-face? That, uh, that referee that everyone really found annoying. can't remember his name. Mark Clattenburg. I think it was Mark Clattenburg. Boom, there you go. Uh, Flash, Fire, Fletch, you got one. It wasn't Walcott and Rooney. It was Rooney, but Sam, man, you got it. It's Duncan Edwards. Duncan Edwards was the youngest. I think he was around about 200 days younger than uh, Cobby. And I think Rooney was around about 100-ish younger than Cobby. And I'll tell you what, a little, little teaser for, for the video we've got coming up this weekend. I'm really, really enjoying the... I'm, jo I'm enjoying the creative process behind the short narrative story videos we're doing. One coming out tomorrow, fingers crossed, or Thursday, is going to be on Vidic and Van Dijk. I did one on Gary Neville, really enjoyed doing that. So I'll tell you what, I'm just, I'm just going to keep loading the gun. I'm going to keep loading the gun because Vidic and Van Dijk is next. And the video I want to do at the weekend, I want to do it around Kobe Mainu and Wayne Rooney. And that's all I'll tell you for now. All right, but there's a, there's a narrative I think that we should, that I want to sort of, put into a video and I'm not saying that Kobe Mainu is going to be the next Wayne Rooney all right but you'll see the video this weekend oh look at that who's that Schwab 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 gifted 10 memberships thank you very much dude well not for me anyway who are they for I'm glad to see the buttons are working all right we've had we've had a good run with the buttons and now I've got the um I've got the the chat working too we're, we're in a good place we're in a good place right now Bellingham, Mainu, and Rice. That had, 
that sounds like, like the most balanced midfield you are ever likely to get for England, man. Mainu. You probably have Mainu as the deeper of the three. Rice is that hybrid between the two. And Bellingham is probably... I mean, what position is Bellingham? Is he number 10? He's, he's like an... He's like an He's such an aggressive number eight that he kind of goes into a number 10 role, right? For Real Madrid. I don't really know. I know All I know is he's been scoring goals galore for Real Madrid this season. Um, but that is a midfield trio. Mwah. Henderson, off your pop, son. Just go back to Saudi Arabia. See ya. No one cares about you. Calvin Phillips. Eh. Man City normally get it right in the um, transfer market, but Calvin Phillips, woof, they got that one wrong. Um, and then anybody else, phew, go away. But I've got this quote on screen here. So what's your take on Kobe Mainu? Because this is something that is a... It's hard not to get so excited when you see a player this good. I don't care that Henderson's at Ajax. He's just go back to Saudi Arabia anyway. You know, hilariously, he didn't get paid for all that because of tax reasons. <laughs> Turned his back on all of his principles for a massive payday and then never got paid. <laughs> Hope that was worth it, Jordan. Anyway, copy my It's Do you want him to go? Do you want him to start for England? Do you want him to go to the Euros? It kind of like because yes, I do, but I don't. Stu! What? Whoa! I'm making weird noises now. Stu, my man. You're a proper OG of the channel, but that's more than OG. That is. Don behaviour. Nuruddin steps out. This is like the greatest tag team in the world. <laughs> Stu comes in from top four, rope. <laughs> three, two, the buttons are working. One. The buttons are working. Mate, Stu has just gifted five zero memberships. And I tell you what's coming soon, Stu. I tell you this. This is a cool thing. I'm looking forward to doing this. That was a terrible one. Look one more. Man, the gong. <laughs> the gong. <laughs> but something that's coming very soon, right? Once I get the merchandise all completely launched, there's going to be a special embroidered um, bit of merchandise that is only going to uh, those who generously gift 50 memberships to the channel. And it will be a special, it won't be public anywhere, and it will just be for you. So Stu, you're going to be getting one of those. And I'm going to write down and go through the list of names I remember who have gifted 50 before, and I'll get this to them. Big up to all of you, man. You're all, you're all legends. You really, really are. You're continuing to help this community grow. And you're allowing me to invest in, I've got new editors coming on board to make more of the short narrative videos. Got really really good editors coming on board for the deep dives the quality of the content is just going up and up and up so anything you're investing into the community here i'm investing back into it to make it bigger and better it's so a big up to all of you man you're all legends you really really are um right let's go up here and let's move on to the next talking point which is and this is what this is what i mean about exciting actually i got i got distracted there I'm going to read, quickly read some of your comments out about Kobe Mania and whether you want him to go to the Euros, whether you're excited about it, whether you're just, I don't know, worried about it. David, you're saying, I'd like him to go to the Euros, but also would like him to be rested as a key for United now and for him to be well rested next season could be key. At his age, could end up burnt out. Well, would you say Rooney got burnt out? Michael Owen did. I don't know whether I don't know whether I would say that Rooney got burnt out, but playing that much football at that age, that's a bit like your body's not completely developed yet. It can be dangerous. It can be. So that's what I mean. There, there is a um, there is a fine line to walk between wanting Kobe Manu to go there to start every game. To oh, that's gone actually. My bad. Whoop. Kobe Mainu to go there and start every game to be that guy. From a selfish perspective, I would like Kobe Mainu to be on the plane for Euro 2024. 
I think he's I think he's ready for it. All right. I think I think he's ready for it. That's not what I'm worried about. What I would be worried about is how big a set of pricks England fans are. All your Millwall Daves and your Chelsea Dans and all of them would be standing there with pitchforks waiting for a mistake. You saw what happened after the Euro 2020 final. And I will ne- I, I, I said this before, I will never ever forgive Southgate as a manager for not playing Sancho or Rashford really at any point during the entire tournament and then bringing them on. And they, it didn't even give them a chance to kick a ball before they took penalties at Wembley in a Euro 2020 final. And it was just like, I don't know what was going through their heads right at that point in time, but as a manager, I think he really let them down. So I know what will happen if Kobe makes any sort of mistake. And he's an 18-year-old, so of course he could make mistakes. I'd be worried about the workload more than I would be worried about his mentality. I think he could he could absolutely cope with the international stage. I think he should be on the plane. I think it's good for his development, but I don't exactly want him to go to Euro 2024. 20, Got there in the end. And start every single game, which he might do. It's curious. Now, somebody else, as I said, who is enjoying his breakthrough is Alejandro Garnacho. And I said this to you well, earlier this, early this week. If you look, if you look at um, Garnacho's first performance for Argentina compared to the most recent one against El Salvador, it's just, uh, it's night and day in terms of the development of the individual. So much better, so much more compact. Just decision making, where he's looking, where he's running to, being a step ahead. Garnacho looks so much better, and he's going to get his first start for Argentina against Costa Rica. Anybody staying up to 2.45 in the morning? I'm not. But I hope I wake up to find out that Alejandro Garnacho got two goals and an assist and a man of the match performance against Costa Rica. Any Argentina fans in the comments? Maybe, maybe not. But um, how strong is Argentina's squad now in those wide departments? Di Maria, he's retired surely by now, right? Di Maria is surely retired. I actually don't know who they've got as their options. So look. Argentina national team. That's their squad. Wikipedia. Let's go down here. Share the screen. Did it, did it, did it. Julian Alvarez, Di Maria Gonzalez, Martinez. He's not exactly one. Los Celso. McAllister plays through the middle. Fernando plays through the middle. Well, there's, op- there's opportunities there, really. Hmm. There's opportunities there. Martinez is far more of a centre forward. Don't actually really know him much about him. Di Maria is still there. My God. My word. Anyway, I can see you all saying it down in the comments, and I completely agree with you there. Garnacho, I absolutely would be worried about him burning out because Garnacho, I think now. What's he on? I think he's on like 27 consecutive starts for United. I think so. There, thereabouts. But it's just... <sighs> this crop of youngsters, right? And go back here. I could even get a photo of the FA Youth Cup winning team if I want to. But that was them in pre-season last season? I think it was. Was Kobe? In... I'm sure he was. I can't remember. Anyway, they won the FA Youth Cup together. Garnacho broke through into the first team a season earlier than Kobe. Then Kobe had his breakthrough. And now, at the age of 18 and 19, they're going to be making their, f- their competitive, well, friendlies, they're going to be making their full international debuts within 12 hours of each other. And I think that's a pretty cool story. I really, really do. And you can actually see him, you can see him peeping in the background there. <laughs> Ezra Asmus Hoyland too, but Hoyland, Manu, Garnacho, 18, 19, 21. I think it's players like this 
it's not just about getting excited that Jim Ratcliffe is, I'm excited about it, but I'm still, you know, I've got some trepidation. I've got some concerns that it might not happen. I'm excited to see where this new direction of United goes forward, but also I'm excited because we've got Guy Nacho. I'm excited because we've got Kobe Manu. I'm excited because we've got Rasmus Hoyland. And that's a pretty good segue, I suppose, to go into a conversation. I'm going to speak about Dan Ashworth for a little bit and Omar Barada and, and Eric Ten Hag's future before we go on to have a proper conversation about the shift in strategy and what we're starting to see appear in the news. <laughs> I thought this was a little funny photo. They're proper, they're proper like best buds, aren't they? <laughs> Delo absolutely loves Ronaldo. I think Ronaldo loves Delo as well. <laughs> they're going to be like two old grey Portuguese dudes just like sitting on the rocking chairs. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why it makes me laugh so much. But Delo has been, I think I would quite happily argue that Delo has been our player of the season so far. I think, I'm trying to think of who you would, if it's not Di answers in the comments, all right. If it's not Diogo Delo, who is Man United's player of the season? Or who can be involved in a conversation? I think Maguire up to a certain point, but I think Delo has been better than him overall. Um, Bruno Fernandes hasn't been at his levels that he has been previously, so I don't think so. Garnacho, I think that's a very very fair shout. Garnacho is definitely involved in that conversation. So that's Delo and Garnacho. Um. It's probably going to be one of those two. In fact, I'm going to put that down as a, as a poll now. Let's see. Who's your player of the season so far? I can do a poll again today. Very nice. Couldn't do that yesterday. Who is your player of the season? So far. Right. People, you can mention Rasmus. I know you can mention Rasmus, but truth be told, he didn't score in his first 14 games. He's been fantastic since, but he didn't score in his first 14 league games. I don't think you can involve him. McTominay? All right. I'll humor you all. I'll put McTominay in there. Now, Johnny Evans... I I don't think on the level of Garnacho, Delo or Matomine. Bruno, again, I don't think has been at the levels that he's been in previous seasons where he won player of the season. So I've just put that poll there. Why is that giving me the spinny wheel of death? Because that's now made my YouTube chat disappear. Hmm. I don't like that. I'm going to have to pull up something. Why are things... Technology. Why you do this to me? Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. I'm going to have to open up a separate YouTube window here now to get a backup chat going because I've just started the poll, but by me starting the poll, it's crashed it. Chat going because I've just started. Right, there you go. I've got the poll up here now. I can see my face. There's too many screens going on here. How are you supposed to concentrate? Right, I'll let that poll run for a bit. Like, can you see? You've got 200 votes in the first, like, minute. 57% of you are saying Delo. 35% of you are saying Garnacho. And 9% of you are saying McTominay. <laughs> that many votes that quick has killed the PC. <laughs> Sod knows what it is. It's not a PC, though. It's a Mac. Come on, get it right. Why has it done that? One second, let me try and refresh it. Go over here, custom browser docs. Do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Base. One second there. I'll try one more thing. And see if I can get that fixed. Custom browser docs. Well, that's the last time I... YouTube, for good for goodness sake, can you please, for the love of God, allow mods to run polls? Do you know how stupid it is you don't allow mods to run polls? They should be able to. Has that worked? Nah. Right. Poll thing's just not work. I've got it up on a separate screen here. No idea what's going on here. None whatsoever. Technology? Whoa, man. It's, it is an absolute... It drives me nuts. It drives me insane, the amount of things I have to do. But, we, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Right, the poll's over there. Jeez. Right, anyway, I can see some chat over here. Jonah, it's, and no, it's nothing to do with the Mac being the issue, right? It's completely and utterly fine. Don't come in here with our... <clears throat> I'm not asking for IT support in the middle of a stream, all right? <laughs> ah, right. I did this video yesterday, right? And I said... 
it's kind of strange that there's not too many people really speaking about it because the kind of narrative and the conversation around Eric Ten Hag and whether he's going to be Manchester United manager next season is all around, does Jim Ratcliffe want him to be there? Um, and I think the reason I did that video is because I don't think anybody's having the other conversation of saying, well, will Eric Ten Hag want to work in a, a reduced power role? And I think it's worthy of a conversation. Because I think it's... I We spoke about this yesterday on the show. I, I imagine... I imagine this conversation has already been had behind the scenes. You'd think so, right? Otherwise, it, because it, it, the Jim Rackley has been very clear on this new structure and everything being put in place on all the new people who are coming into power at Manchester United. Now, something I found quite funny was this, right? I didn't actually get these organised or set. Let's do this. You've got Samuel Luckhurst here saying, look, it is understood Omar Barada would be the de facto kingmaker on any decision taken over Eric Ten Hag's future, which, is, of course, is correct and should be correct because he's the CEO. <laughs> and then you're seeing, oh, hold on here, Man United are waiting for Ashworth to join before we're... <laughs> it's like, make your mind up. Is it, is it sort of Barada being the kingpin or is it just like we're waiting for Ashworth to come in? I don't see how... Of course, Dan Ashworth is going to be in directly involved in the conversations about whether or not Eric Ten Hag stays. Okay, but I, I just I, I I don't see that being a reason that United are or are not making a decision. My my gut instinct is that United have already made the decision behind the scenes. That's what I think. Of course, that could change depending on what happens this season. We go and get pumped by Brentford. We go and get pumped by Chelsea. And we go and get pumped by Liverpool. The conversation does change. Oh, that game against Brentford's a big one on Saturday, isn't it? Eight o'clock. Nightmares of last season. Hmm. I don't personally... but You know what I want there to be an update on? I want, I want there to be an update on bloody Dan Ashworth. That's what I want. It's been a while. There's not really been an update. Not really much has been said. Alex, you're saying no one knows who will decide as there's no leaks. Well, there wasn't any any leaks really about um, Omar Barada. I didn't know who Omar Barada was until he was our CEO. That's the perfect appointment. Also, the, my favourite sorts of signings. And I hope we go to start making more of those. Um, we'll see. We'll continue to, to follow it. Now, let's move on to the transfer conversation, which I do think is actually a... Um, it's an exciting conversation. This we already know, right? We've spoken about this before. It's obvious, right? You can't go... You can't go... What percentage of this season so far would you say Man United have had a fit left back for? 10%? I reckon about 10%. Somewhere between... Yeah, between? Between 10 and 20%. One second there. Can you block people on here? Block user on Facebook. See you later, mate. So I just see some spamming up in here. Stu, you're saying 5%. Ricky, you're saying 15 2%, says Schwab. I don't even know. It really, really does not feel like much, right? 18% statistically, says that. Oh, there you go. Anyway, not much. So, of course, we're going to be signing a new left back. But we have already spoken in detail about this this is a shift in strategy from Manchester United, all right? I would rather sign the next Mbappe than buy Mbappe. And this is what... If, if you're talking about the identity of Manchester United or... I mean, are transfers really the identity? No, transfers can't really be involved in the identity of Manchester United. But where you're looking is part of the identity because part of the identity is not being a Galactico club. Part of the identity is signing a player who's got bags of talent, but then the environment of Manchester United is where they thrive and shine and they turn into superstars. Whether that's Rooney, Ronaldo, Vidic, Evra. Eh, Carrick was already pretty established before he came in, but there's there's loads of others. Right? That's That's been Manchester United's biggest successes in the transfer window 
has been spotting those talents, bringing them in, and the environment. And this is this is this is an important part of why it's kind of not really worked at United. The environment being correct for them to thrive and shine. It hasn't been a while, it hasn't been the case for a long, long time. But that's where conversations around this lad are quite interesting, right? This is Aaron Anselmina, who's an 18-year-old centre-back who plays for Boca Juniors. And he's got, I believe, around about a $20 million release clause. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this a little bit later in the show, this is this is not gospel. We're not definitely going out and signing him. Let's not just do like tons of research into Anselmina. What this does do is gives us a little bit of an insight into maybe a shift in strategy and a really exciting shift in strategy. And I'll explain exactly why. First of all, you know I need to look at the South American market, all right? I think the last player that we signed from South America was Pellistri. And the issue's not been scouting, all right? We've got scouts everywhere. I... <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if United's got one of the biggest scouting networks in the world. The amount of data that comes into our club. We're just crap at using said data. But Aaron Anselmino, this is an interesting one because of this, right? The reports all suggest that the 18-year-old is heavily linked with Manchester United. And if Manchester United were to sign him, that we would then loan him back out, see him develop, before then coming to Manchester United. So you could conceivably... As you see there, United want to sign important talents and loan them out to Nice. Think about the logic here of what it could do. Now, I don't really like the multi-club model, okay? I really don't. I wish it never existed. But it's now a case of you're going to get left behind if you don't adopt it. It's the way that modern football has gone. And you can be angry and stick to your principles if you want, but then you're just going to get, get overrun. You'll become an irrelevance in the modern game. You have to adapt. And Man United are going to be adapting to that model because we've now got a multi-club system. We've got Lausanne in Switzerland, we've got Nice in France, and we've got United. And maybe there's going to be more added to it. But the, con the concept here is, think about it logically, Manchester United go out this summer and we sign Jean-Claire Tadebo from Nice. That right-sided centre-back, a defender of a profile that we massively need, right? Brilliant. He comes to United. Then Aaron Anselmino goes to Nice. He then spends a year, maybe two years, at Nice. Develops. Plays top-level football. Depending on what happens with Nice this season, he'll play European football as well. Maybe even Champions League. No, probably not Champions League football. But then Anselmino goes to Nice for a year or two. And then what happens? Then Manchester United sign him. We get him as for example, a 20-year-old centre-back with two years of European football experience under his belt. And all of a sudden, the player coming into Manchester United is not just a raw product from Boca Juniors. Might work, might not work. But that there is a smarter ploy. And it, it goes in for, as I said, this is 100% this is worthy of a lunchtime video because there's far more detail that I can add to all of this. But on top of that, you see, what's his name here? Um, Francesco Camada, 16-year-old from Milan. Uh, basically, the reports are all suggesting that he hasn't signed his first professional contract yet, but at the age of 16, Manchester United can't sign him because of Brexit. We cannot sign anybody under the age of 18 and bring them to England. But what we can do is follow a trend and a pattern that has... Real Madrid have been leading with it for a long time. There'll be a name that you all know this week. That'll be Endrick. Now, he's joining Real Madrid. Is he joining Real Madrid this summer, I think? Yep, he joins Real Madrid in July 2024. And he's already made his Brazil debut. He's already scored on his Brazil debut. And Real Madrid signed him when he was 16. Now, he stayed at Palmeiras in Brazil. But this is something that a lot of clubs are doing. Spurs did it with, what's his face? Lucas, eh, can't remember his name. The kid who came to United for like two, three trials, but we never actually got him. Um, it's it's part of um, it's part of the modern transfer game, all right. And this is why it's so ridiculously difficult to be successful in the transfer market because 
not only do you need to think about, right, who do I need this summer? Who am I selling this summer? You also need to think about who do I need to sign for two years time and three years time and four years time and five years time. You have to, you have to have a clear vision of not only the current summer, but the three summers ahead. And you have to manage both of those at the same time. Now imagine you're Eric Ten Hag. What, I'm supposed to be getting my preseason done and I'm supposed to be doing all that. Oh no, I'd leave it to John Murto. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, well, that worked, didn't it? This is a, is a shift in strategy towards a trend which is not new in any way, shape or form. But signing players younger, really trusting your scouts, because there's a lot of trust, right? Okay, whatever, whatever. it wasn't in Hendrick's Brazil debut, I don't care. Um, he scored against England at Wembley. And I believe... What did they pay for it? They paid like 40, 60. I don't know if the price is going to be in here. They played, they paid a bucket load for Endrick. And this is this is just the way that football has gone. Like Real Madrid have uh the best at it, right? You look at Vinicius Jr., you look at Rodrigo, you look at Endrick, right? They love signing Brazilian talents and they get it right. Not all the time, but they do get it right sometimes. And when they get it right, they get superstars but you have to spend big. You have to take a massive punt. If it pays off, well, you might find your new Neymar. You might find your Hendrix. And that's what this strategy points towards. First of all, it's good to see United actually being linked to um, players from the South American market. Because... It's so annoying how we haven't. It's just, it's ridiculously annoying. There is so much talent in the South American market and we just, for, seeming, for some reason, we just never, I don't think it's due to a lack of scouting or lack of information. We just seemingly have never just, actually haven't gone there in a long time. Palicio, as I said, I think was the last one. So this will be an interesting one. And that con that conversation, that concept of using the multi-club model to bring in Anselmino, to then maybe sign Tadebo, to then see Anselmino go to Nice, develop for two years, and then come to Manchester United as a far more developed and ready-made player. That's a long, that's a, that's a short and a medium and a long-term strategy. And that's a quite new and exciting strategy. So I'm going to do this in far more detail in my lunchtime video today, but I'm really quite excited by the idea of that. Now, I'm, not, I'm not here saying that we're definitely going to be signing Aaron Anselmino and that Francesco Camado, who, by the way, must have... Some of the most ridiculous numbers I've ever seen for a youth team striker. I think he's made a, I think he's made like a handful of first team appearances. But if we were to sign him, it would be a similar sort of conversation. We'd sign him on a professional contract, but then we'd loan him back out to probably wouldn't be to Milan because they wouldn't be very happy about it, but to another team. Let him develop for a year before then joining Manchester United when he is 18 years old in the same way that Endrick is joining them as an 18-year-old. Danny, you're saying, Sam, it seems like you're finally on board with the multi-club structure. Dude, I'm telling you, I, I do not want the multi-club structure, but we have one now. Whether I, I, I can get angry and just shout from the rooftops, ah, oh, this and that. Or I can speak about, you know, what it might actually look like going forward for our club. And this is just part of the problem in modern football that has happened thanks to City and the City Group, Red Bull and what they've done. And it's, well, Chelsea just bought Strasbourg as well. Liverpool are about to do it. Like, you can, you can get left behind if you want. And the reason I don't like the multi-club structure is because it really just damages the integrity of the Football League, of just everything else, really. Because instead of it being one big club at the top that you're now aiming for... You've now got to try, try and topple a club at the top and also there's three feeder clubs who all feed into it. It's like, it's already difficult enough for those clubs to topple. It's just, I don't think it's good for competitive integrity. So I'd rather it didn't exist. But it also does exist. And Liverpool are about to get one. That's the only reason that Michael Edwards has gone and became their, I don't know what his position is. Is he CEO? I think he is. He's basically saying the reason I'm going here is because I don't want to be in charge of Liverpool. I want to be in charge of Liverpool and this club that we're going to sign. 
Um, we in the past have had feeder clubs, is what they were called, wasn't it? Royal Antwerp, I remember that. Do you remember, was it Marnik Vermeile? I remember that was a Belgian defender that we had. He went out on loan there. Tons of players went out on loan there. And it wasn't really a feeder club. Well, it was a club that we had an agreement with where we could send our young players on loan, where they would, the environment we knew was safe and good and they could develop. It's kind of like just a safe loan, really. I suppose that's what um, Lausanne could be. You might start seeing that. Some United players going... In fact, I would, I would absolutely predict it. You know how we've had so many crap loan spells, right, over the years? Like Dan, Dan Gore's had a naff one at Port Vale. I think he's injured. There's loads of them. But now you're probably going to start seeing United players going out maybe to Lausanne or maybe the, the, the level of competition is not good enough there so it won't really develop them. Maybe, maybe not. Nice, not really sure they're going to be used as just a place for developing United players. I don't know. I imagine there's probably more clubs that are going to come into this model. We'll see. I'm going to go down and read, me, read some of your comments down there because I think this is... As I, I, I find this quite an interesting topic. topic. Scott. Scott Power. It reminds me of... Um, the Simpsons episode where uh, <laughs> Homer, I swear Homer renamed himself to Max Power. <laughs> Big up to you, dude. Gift in 20 memberships. Are you related to Max Power? Yes or no? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, Brian is saying it's a step better than the players rotting in the academy. Well, the under-18 setup is fantastic now. But between under-18s and first-team football, there's a chasm. Under-21s is crap. They hardly ever play. Um... And then you have to you have to you have to go into the loan market. Remember when United said, "Oh yeah, we've looked at all these places, and Port Vale was the best for Dan Gore." And it's like, "Well, he's hardly ever played." Brilliant. Um, did, 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 did. Our multi club structure includes an African club where the Afcon final was played. Eh? What? Who? I don't know about that. Uh, let me see what else you're saying down here in the comments. Actually, let me go back to the poll. We finally got the comments working from Facebook, and then. The YouTube comments broke. <laughs> it just uh, my software just doesn't want you to enjoy yourself. Bad, isn't it? Um, right, so we've got 760 votes in 20 minutes, and as it stands, 51% of you are saying the low has been our your player of the season so far. Garnacho's 41, and McTominay's eight. <sighs> I think I'll go Delo. But that's actually quite, that's actually harder than I thought it was. Hmm. And you're saying that the kids developing so rapidly now that Premier League 2 is hopeless. Man, I, look, right? This lad, for example. Well, Kobe Mainu. Alejandro Garnacho. I've been saying this for a long time and it's completely true, but the reason... Rooney stood out so much. I think he was a 16-year-old when he made his debut for or scored that goal against Arsenal. Um, it's it's not that there were no teenagers breaking through at that age. It's just that when they did, they were like, my God, look at that kid. He's incredible. Whereas now, you've got, well, right now we've got 18-year-old Colby Mayne, who's just making his England debut. You've got Jude Bellingham. Man, it is ridiculous. I've never seen a footballer as good as he is. And he's only, what, is he 20 now? He's already been around for years. It's just... The quality of an 18-year-old now is light years ahead, on average, than 10 years ago. And I imagine that's got a lot to do with um, better sort of grassroots, better sort of facilities, better training, better education, better fitness, better, better nutrition. They become professional in the way that they act a lot younger. And they develop a lot faster as a consequence. And that, I think, is why you're seeing so many. Just that the quality of younger players is as high as it has ever been which actually ties, out, ties really nicely into the concept that Manchester United are switching our transfer policy away from signing Mbappes towards buying Mbappes. Now, naturally, people are going to be disagreeing with me, disagreeing with me in the comments. Um, but 
Well, I don't think so. I I, th I think the quality of teenagers coming through now is higher than it's ever been. And I, th I personally think it's only going to keep increasing. Uh, Lamau, uh, there's there's tons you can mention now, and then there's also there's tons you can mention previously. So oh, look, they were great back here as well. I'm not saying they weren't great there, but I think on average, I think there's more of them. So I'm going to do my lunchtime video on this lad, Aaron Anselmino, and also this lad, Francesco Camada, and, and just a wider conversation about the shift in trends, or maybe the shift in strategy towards signing younger players and the involvement of the multi-club model, looking towards the South American market and also following trends that other clubs have been doing for years. Of course, and, and the beauty of an academy is you don't have to look outside. And that's why academy signings at a younger age, it's, this, this is just, all these things are interconnected. You have to be able to spot the best 12 to 15 year old players that you can bring into your academy setup from the outside. Also, maybe sometimes 16 year old. We signed Hannibal when he was 16. Uh, we signed Guy Nacho, I think, when he was 16. We've signed some great players into our academy at those ages. But then also, it's just, I don't think anything gets me more excited than the concept of bringing in younger signings and just watching them flourish. And that's a strategy I can completely get behind. United. That is a strategy I want United to do. We tried, man, with this Galactico bollocks. Ed Woodward looked at Real Madrid and went, ah, oh, we can do that. I can do that. And it failed miserably. We have wasted so much money and I'm bored of wasting money. I would much, and, and, and you know what? This, this probably ties in a lot to me uh, with why I give players more time when they come to United. Because if we go out and we sign, hypothetically, we go and sign Aaron Anselmino, he goes to Nice, he develops for a year, he comes to United as a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old, and he makes a couple of mistakes. There's going to be people that are going to be going, driving the knife in. United fans are going to be doing that. Because of the culture, the society now of instant gratification, you have to be sick straight away. And if you're not sick straight away, you're crap, gone, get out. Oh, Nana, boot him out. Terrible goalkeeper. Let's spend another 50 million. He's terrible. New, new Claudio Bravo. I remember at one point I said that at this, point, at this point in time, he's looking more like a Claudio Bravo. But look at him since the African Cup of Nations. Like you, all you had to do was look objectively at the fact that Onana was in the Champions League final last season and was a top five goalkeeper in the world. Oh, all of a sudden, he's crap at United. Oh, he's a crap goalkeeper. No. Boy, is he just struggling mentally. Looks a lot better now. And I think he's starting to look a lot more, not brash, but aggressive in the way that I thought he was going to be aggressive. Coming out there, swinging top ropes, claiming high balls, actually being a little bit more towards the edge of his own box rather than retreating. I think him getting lobbed. Was it Lons in the preseason? I think that actually affected him quite a lot. Anyway, these are interesting conversations, all right? And it's definitely worth a lunchtime video for me today. I've said that about 100 times now. I'm going to try it and see what you're saying down here in the comments. Um... Oh, David. Man. Nuruddin's inspired everybody in here, I think. David, can't you just gifted that. 10 memberships, man. Football bloody, hell. Football, bloody hell. I will update these at some point soon, but I quite like it. I do like a bit of Fergie. I'd love to get him on for an interview. Don't think that's ever going to happen. I want to get Ralph Radnick. That's... I think Ralph Radnick would probably be one of my... I think I've said this before, haven't I? I think he would be my top choice. For a um, for a chat, because now that Jim Ratcliffe is in charge, I don't think it, he could say a lot of stuff. Well, I'm not sure he would. He never will. Aren't Austria like crushing it today? Not today. I swear they're they're playing really quite well. I'm gonna go down here and see what you're saying in the comments. All right, gonna have to look over here because well, no, this will do. <laughs> John, what's my lunchtime video? I haven't mentioned it. I haven't mentioned it yet. Uh, Alex said, I hope this doesn't mean that United go in the total direction Chelsea have. They need to pick good talent and also unearth some gems who can fit in short to mid-term. No one's going down the Chelsea route. I hope. Or we're all screwed. Joe Warren saying, McTominay, new contract. I saw that. Um, 
I think, of course, it would depend on the terms, on the price, on what he wanted. But I really think United could do a lot worse than a correctly profiled Scott McTominay being a squad player for us. I said it last season. I said there's a there's plenty of players in this squad that I would get rid of before Scott McTominay, and, and the point still stands. If a big bid, if a really big bid came in for um, McTominay, then we'd have to consider it. But I would not be looking to ship him out. I would personally, I would sell Maguire first. I would sell what we got. Who who have we got that's going to be leaving this summer? Guaranteed. Let's have a quick look. Obviously, there's going to be a few that are free transfers. So we're not going to get any money for him, but there'll be wages off the bill. So that's good in a sense. Let's pull this up here. Right. So you got... Uh, well, Bayern will... He might leave. He like hasn't kicked the ball yet, so he might leave. Yeah, goalkeeper's not going to get getting any money there. Lindelof should be sold. Maguire, I think if the right big comes in, I think should be sold. Martinez going nowhere, and Madisea, we don't know if he's been kidnapped. So, Varane, you know my take on Varane. I don't think he should be given a contract worth north of £300,000 a week, nor do I think he will sign a wage cut that will be on the level that United need. So I think Rafa Varane will leave and go into the sun in Saudi Arabia, and I don't think we could begrudge him for it. But we need to spend big on centre-back. We need two top-level centre-backs this summer. If you get Victor, if you get Lindelof, Maguire, and Varane all out, and then you sign two top level centre backs, and then you got Cam Waller in as a third, and maybe you give Johnny Evans one year contract, I think that puts United's um, United centre back positions far better. So you could get money for Lindelof, you could get money for Maguire, Varane could leave on a free. The rest aren't really going anywhere, and we probably sign a left back. Amrabat, well, we're not going to sign him on a permanent deal, are we? Uh, the less I say about Amrabat, the better, really. I don't want to be wrong. Well, I don't actually think... Uh, no, let's just not speak about him. Mason Mount will be a new sign. Um, Ericsson will... Might leave. Is he... Is this contract run out? I can't remember if it does. Casemiro. Again, just predictions. I think... I think a, a bid... I think a substantial bid comes in for Casemiro from Saudi Arabia that I don't think Manchester United will say no to. Spidey senses. Donny van der Beek, I don't even think Eintracht, was it Eintracht he's at? I don't think they want him. Hannibal, I don't think they're going to, he's going to be signed by Sevilla. But again, you're looking at lots of players there that could be sold. Uh, and obviously as youth products, they would get, well, Hannibal, you get 100% profit. Martial, you know he's still a United player. It's incredible. It's incredible. He's put, he's put in, <laughs> Pardon me, putting Phil Jones to shame. And Jane Sancho will be leaving, and hopefully that'll be good money. Well, actually, Sancho and Greenwood will probably be two of the biggest uh, incomes. We're going we're gonna to make some dough this summer, man. Pellissery might be sold too. Hmm. There's so many. Uh, so many. I, I've, I've, I'll, I'll be doing like a proper in-depth video on my predictions when the time is right. It's 26th of March. It's a little bit too early. <sighs> this summer, I think will be the most exciting that we've seen in a long, long time. With new ownership, with new direction, we can go in with actual genuine belief of a new strategy. And that's going to be my lunchtime video today. Ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. It will be. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, let me have a look at the poll. Finish the poll. 1,000 votes. Come on. 1,000 votes. Big up to all of you. Drop a like on the video, by the way. We've got, what, 1,300 of you watching, and there's only 400 likes. 900 of you right now. Or well, 800 of you right now. Just hit that like button. You can make it fly up. I mean, you won't. You won't. Anyway. Um, Philip, you're saying Manasi has got some mental issues. I'm not speculating on that. I spoke about it yesterday. It came from a random person in Germany. And of course, he's mentally struggling, having missed an entire career after two botched surgeries and a further setback. Even the most resilient individual is going to suffer mentally from that, right? Big up to all of you. Thank you all for tuning in. I'll be here tomorrow morning, as always. 
I think you'll enjoy today's lunchtime video. And yeah, hit me up in Discord, fire in your video suggestions, and I'll see you soon.